wish we could come on the air with some sweet, sweet relief from the heat, especially since it's going from scorching to merely stifling here in the east. But this may be just the start with another round of extreme heat out west ahead. We're live in the thick of a wildfire on the doorstep of Yosemite. We'll talk about why this dry weather is making it even more dangerous. Plus, a scary moment at an airport in Dallas after a woman apparently took out a gun and started shooting. Nobody got hurt, but it's turned into a travel nightmare. We'll take you there. And Indiana, now at the center of this battle over abortion access in this post-Roe world, with lawmakers today getting together to talk about a near total ban in that state. Why the vice president was there and what she's hoping to get out of the visit. Plus, turns out getting catfished online can be pretty pricey to the tune of millions of dollars. In tonight's original, we'll explain why so-called romance scams are on the rise. And another out-of-control TikTok trend has people adding a new and not-so-ideal step to their makeup routine. We'll tell you why it's not so pretty in pink coming up later in the show. Hey, I'm Hallie, and right now this country seems to be stuck in one giant game of Pong because every time it feels like you're getting away from this heat wave, another part of the country gets it, and then it just comes back out to you. That's what we're seeing right now. We're here in the east. We're finally getting a little bit of relief from the most extreme heat in the form of major storms that are causing big-time delays. But it's going to be short-lived because another dangerous triple-digit heat wave is building out west. And you can see the warnings on the map right here, right? Nearly 50 million Americans are under heat alerts, basically. I mean, look at that. When do I play meteorologist? Only when the heat is this bad, gang, okay? Because it could hit the low hundreds in Portland, maybe as high as 115 in inland Washington. Remember, just last year, hundreds of people died in the Pacific Northwest, with scientists back then calling it a once-in-a-thousand-year heat wave that might be happening again. Okay, record temperatures are also hitting New England. You've got highs of 90s in Providence and Hartford, even 100 degrees in Boston, where rolling power outages made everything feel worse. New York's on its seventh straight day, hitting above 90. Newark, not too far away, had five days of 100 in a row. And in California, you've got wildfires starting like the Oak Fire, 30 miles from Yosemite National Park. It is now only 10 percent contained after burning something like 17,000 acres. Thousands of people had to be evacuated. And it was so big that, yes, you could see it from space. Look at that picture. And if you're looking for relief from Washington, don't hold your breath. President Biden's climate agenda is stalled because of West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin. And some on Capitol Hill are pretty ticked off about that. Six House aides actually got arrested for protesting outside the top Senate Democrats office, Chuck Schumer, demanding that he pick up again on climate negotiations. We're going to talk about this heat with Jesse Kirsch in just a minute. But I want to start with George Solis, who is in the thick of this fire right near Yosemite out in Mariposa, California. And, George, you know, part of the problem is it's hot. Part of the problem is it's dry. And part of the problem is that it's super steep. So firefighters, you know, can't get a lot of access from the ground. They've got to come after it from the air. That's right, Hallie. It's kind of a perfect storm for a really bad scenario. And behind me, you can still see that smoke billowing from the Oak Fire right there. You can just, poof, pluming everywhere. Now here, the damage still significant, and we still don't have a full scope as this fire is still burning. But I want to show you really quick. We are on the property of Roger Rodney, excuse me, McGuire, who allowed us to be here to show us, to allow you to show you, excuse me, long day out here, uh, how bad this fire can be when it's been raging. Take a look. This is what's left of his home. Right there, some fitness equipment, completely gone. There's a wall there. Looks like that was his stove area. Totally just disheveled. So right now, as you mentioned, the firefighters are dealing with pretty tough conditions right now, right? The terrain is pretty terrible. It's dry out here. There's still some areas that are, you can see some of the hot spots still smoldering. So that's why firefighters right now are still in the midst of this, trying to make sure this fire does not spread specific, specific especially towards Yosemite, because already dodging a big bullet. Hallie? George, um, listen, I totally get it. Long day, long night. It's going to be a long couple of days for you, too, and for these firefighters. How much of a threat is it to Yosemite? Because it feels like we were just talking about a national park for a different climate reason, and that was Yellowstone with all of that flooding that happened, right? Now here we are talking about Yosemite. Um, what's the expectation for trying to get this fire under control and the potential threat to that very popular national park? Yeah, well, the good news is firefighters say they believe they can get this fire under control by this weekend. So they are working pretty diligently around the clock to make sure that fire doesn't spread. And you also had, you know, the Washbourne fire that threatened those sequoias around the park. So 
they really can't take another hit. And right now, the wind is also another factor. Right now, it's starting to pick up again, and that is a big concern for firefighters. The air quality, a big concern. We could, we've been hearing reports that you can see some of this smoke and feel it as far as the Bay Area. So you can't see it right here because the fire's already been through this region, but it is out here, and so it does get into your throat. So prolonged exposure is not good. So, you know, presume, that's why people are being told to evacuate if they can and obviously seek shelter so they're not out here for any length of time. Hallie? Real quick, George, dozens of people are out of the houses because of this too, right? Exactly right. And one thing that we want to touch on really quick, while we were out here, we actually found a survivor of this fire, a tiny little kitten or a cat, really. Uh, we were told by the homeowner that there may be a cat when we got to the property. It turns out it wasn't his cat, but this cat totally singed. It's burned its paws. It's been really friendly. Uh, it, it's just so heartbreaking to see that this animal survived through this horrible, horrible situation. And we're going to try and get it some help right away. But one of our uh, audio engineers fell in love with this cat. And good news here, he's decided to take this cat home. So there's a happy ending in all of this. I mean, so many people unfortunately lose their homes. But if we could save at least one tiny animal's life out here, it seems that at least not all hope is lost. Hallie? George Solis, thank you for bringing us that story. Good luck out there. Appreciate it. I want to get to Jesse Kirsch now in Philadelphia. So, Jesse, he heat health emergency, okay? Because we talk about this all the time in the show. It's summer. It's hot. It's supposed to be hot. But it's not supposed to be dangerous hot like this, right? But that's what's happening where you are. Yeah, so here in Philadelphia, we're just a couple hours away now, about two, two plus hours, just shy of three away from that uh, heat health emergency in Philadelphia set to expire. There's one that was extended in Boston as well. And I can tell you, we've been in Philadelphia since Thursday. And uh, there's a demonstrable difference here now versus when we first got here. First of all, the sun has gone away. And the other thing is something you're seeing coming through right now, which is a breeze, which is something that we really just were not seeing throughout this weekend. And if you think about that hot, stale air piling on the humidity with the heat index, you know, in much of the country, we're seeing temperatures feeling like with the heat index upwards of 100 degrees. So that's something that we've been dealing with a lot in the Northeast. Now we're getting this cool front coming in, and I can tell you we are feeling it now. My team out here, I think I speak for all of us when I say we are breathing a sigh of relief because it is finally cooling down here. But, of course, coming with that here in the east is some severe weather as the Pacific Northwest now has some of that excessive heat coming its way, Hallie. What are they doing to make sure people are okay there in Philly, Jess? Yeah, so just outside of Philadelphia in Camden, New Jersey, earlier today we went along with county police officers who are doing door knocks to do wellness checks on seniors. They have a list of people they say they've gotten together over the years, people that are especially vulnerable, be it because of age or a medical condition or knowing they may not have family around. And so they're doing door knocks. They are bringing those citizens water and, and checking on them to make sure they're doing okay. And one of the things that stood out to me is that you would see a fan in the front. Someone said they had an air conditioning unit upstairs. Another woman we spoke with said she had just recently got an air conditioning. So if you think about it, in this kind of condition or the threat of this kind of weather people are not necessarily having central air or some kind of air conditioning unit and you may not you know think about that if you have it yourself but there are certainly people who are, are toughing out the heat with less than ideal yeah. uh, support so to see the police making those checks and there was one woman who said that it's like her daughter having the police officer come and check in on her and it was an emotional experience for her so you can tell yeah. uh, that this is something that you know is bringing that community together there in Camden. Dude, it's like the gold. Right, check on your neighbors. Just make sure people are okay, especially at a time like this. Jesse Kirsch, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Stay cool. We've got some breaking news now to get you from Washington on the January 6th investigation. And just coming into us in the last, I want to say, 45 minutes or so, a source familiar confirms to NBC News that this guy, Mark Short, the former chief of staff to former Vice President Mike Pence, was in front of a federal grand jury here in Washington. Short would be the highest-ranking Trump administration official to testify. He apparently did so under subpoena last week. Remember, Short spoke with the House Select Committee back in January. He was with Pence during the attack. I want to bring in Ken Delanian here. And Ken, it feels like the big takeaway is that it suggests the DOJ's investigation, we know they've gone after these rioters, these people at the Capitol on January 6th. This suggests they're going beyond the attack, beyond those fake elector schemes into the White House, no? Or are we reading too much into that? Well, look. Uh we don't know for sure, Hallie, but Mark Short is a very significant witness, and this is a big development. You're right. In theory, they could just be talking to him about the fake collector scheme, because after all, 
Vice President Mike Pence was essentially a target of that scheme in the sense that they were trying to convince him to slow things down, to recognize this alternative slate of electors. But think about all the things he brings to the table. He was with the vice president in the Capitol. He would be aware of all the efforts by Donald Trump and the people around him to pressure the vice president uh, to do what he wasn't willing to do on January 6th. And what's also interesting, Hallie, is that, you know, Short testified extensively already in front of the January 6th committee. And presumably, federal prosecutors have the benefit of that testimony, yet they wanted to bring him before the grand jury anyway. And, you know, the Department of Justice has been getting a lot of criticism, as you know, from former DOJ. Officials, yeah. commentators, even President Biden reportedly had expressed annoyance with what he viewed as the slow pace of the DOJ investigation. Um, and this is an example of, first of all, we don't know everything they're doing. And secondly, though, this is a big sort of uh, periscope above the water here, suggesting that there is a, an, has been an expansion of this investigation, Alex. A lot of people wanting to peek below the water and see what that, uh, to, to belabor your analogy, what is actually in that submarine? Ken Delanian, thank you very much. <laughs> Appreciate you bringing us that you breaking bet. news. Sticking to Washington here because President Biden, we're seeing him now for the first time in a few days virtually. He's still isolated, still has COVID, obviously, but he's telling reporters just a couple of hours ago, he's feeling great. I'm feeling better every day. I still have this, a little bit of a sore throat and a little bit of a cough. But it's changing significantly. It's now up in the upper part of my, my throat. Actually, it's more around my nose than anywhere else. I think I'm on my way to full total recovery. On his way to a full recovery. His doctor today says the president is still a little congested and hoarse. You probably could hear that in his voice there. He's going to keep taking Paxlovid and a low-dose aspirin. This is all coming up after some questions when we did not see President Biden at all over the weekend and after the White House promised transparency. And President Biden isn't the only big name Washingtonian to come down with COVID. He is the biggest name. But we're also learning today that Senators Lisa Murkowski and Joe Manchin have announced that they, too, have tested positive. The third and fourth senators with a positive test inside the last week. I want to bring in now one of our co-chief White House correspondents, Peter Alexander. So, Peter, here's the question, right, because... Dr. Jha has said and is reiterating now that the president doesn't have to isolate anymore if he gets a negative test after, yeah. I think, after tomorrow, day five, right? So yeah. we know the president wants to be in person end of the week. What's this timeline looking like? And might we see the president in person out of isolation by the weekend? Well, that's what the president's hoping for. Again, he has to get through those five full days. So he has to get through tomorrow, which is his day five, his fifth full day, and have a negative test before he's allowed to return to his normal routine. He said, in his words, God willing, he's going to have a complete and full recovery. And you could hear that raspiness. Sort of sounded like he was doing some cowboy film, right? He was talking like <clears throat> he had a much deeper tone. Um, and Peter, delivering some tough remarks Peter. a little bit later in the day. I was just saying it sounded like Clint Eastwood yeah. to me. I'm just saying. That I was, was just going to say, view. were you trying to do your Clint Eastwood impression right here live okay. on TV? Man. I'm not going to do it. I think we know how, how I've done in the past. Nobody's disputed it. All I will say is the president had a little deep tone and he was delivering some tough remarks a little bit earlier today as, as well. But as for his circumstances, he is hoping to be back at it again in person by the end of the week. He released a picture earlier today when he was in full suit and tie, had his aviators on, his dog commander sitting beside him on one of mm -hmm. the balconies to the residents here at the White House. The president saying this morning he was woken up by his dog because his wife, the first lady, she remains at the couple's home in Wilmington, Delaware. We're told that she has tested negative so far to this point. She and the vice president were both identified as close contacts among 17 individuals identified as close contacts. The vice president testing negative to this point as well. Hallie. Can you give us a gut check, Peter, as you're talking with aides and advisors and sources there in your role um, covering the White House as to the transparency factor here? Because over the weekend, we really didn't see much. Now you've got this, you know, the president taking questions. Yeah. He's showing up virtually. They're streaming it live on the White House website, et cetera, et cetera. Putting out the picture of him and commander, et cetera. Well, it's a priority to the White House to, to, to show the president, frankly, looking like he's in charge. They say he's keeping a full schedule. Karine Jean-Pierre, his press secretary, said last week that he's doing eight plus hours a day, that he's doing conference calls and zooming into conversations uh, with economic teams with his economic advisors. They were talking gas prices last week. He was talking about the need for more microchips to be produced 
in the U.S. today. He delivered a virtual set of remarks to um, a group of black law enforcement executives a little bit earlier when he slammed his predecessor, former President Trump. Clips I know you'll be speaking about over the course of these hours here. I think there was some frustration among some that we weren't hearing directly from the president's doctor. We have heard from the COVID response coordinator, Dr. Ashish Jha. But each day, as per its effort to be transparent, the White House has put out a note from the president's doctor detailing his symptoms. And they do say that at this point, they appear to be almost completely resolved. Hallie. Peter Alexander, thank you very much. Good to see you, friend. So let's press pause on the COVID discussion for a second, because there's another public health discussion that a lot of people are having, and that is about this monkeypox outbreak, with experts saying we are running out of time to contain it here in the U.S. This comes after the World Health Organization sounded its highest possible alarm about monkeypox, calling it an international public health emergency. But you know who is not calling it that yet? The U.S. government. And some health officials think we are losing some critical time on all fronts. We're talking vaccines, testing, contact tracing. So far, a lot of cases are primarily within gay and bisexual communities, but the WHO is warning today this disease could spread to everybody. I want to bring in Dr. Natalie Azar. And Dr. Azar, it feels like what happens in the next few, let's say, days and weeks is going to determine where we are a few months from now, right? Talk about the administration's response so far and why there has been a hesitancy to declare a public health emergency. What do you, what do you, how do you, how do we understand that? You know, I, I think what a lot of experts have been saying, Hallie, is that we're kind of stuck in this individualized view of public health, meaning, you know, what's going on with monkeypox now? Who is it affecting now, as opposed to thinking about who it's going to affect in the future? And clearly, we know that if it is allowed to go unchecked, meaning we're not intervening with vaccines for the people who need them, we are not, you know, getting increasing our access to testing, we're going to see spillover. We're going to see spillover into people in whom monkeypox can be a very serious illness. Obviously, we now know if you're healthy, it can be, you know, very uncomfortable and maybe disfiguring. But if you're immunocompromised or pregnant or very young, it can actually be lethal. So obviously, I can't get into the heads of, of the Biden administration. But, you know, experts have essentially said, look, we need to be really, really aggressive about, you know, active surveillance. That means going out and partnering with LGBTQ plus communities and, you know, going, mapping what, something that's called mapping sexual networks, which is a very interesting thing. You know, it's like you're following individuals, not just on social media apps, but, you know, where individuals at risk are frequenting and following cases. Like, it's a, it's, it's a lot of work, you know, but this is what public health is, is technically yeah. supposed to be doing. Let me ask you about, I think, the question that, that well, at least people that, people that I know, I think people we all know are asking, which is, you know, we know the two kids, for example, in the U.S. have been diagnosed with monkeypox. In my parent network, the question has come up, like, wait, should we be trying to go get a monkeypox vaccine? Should we not? It's not really in our community right now. Right. Give us the professional gut check on where we should be on that. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I don't think we're anywhere near um, more widespread vaccination, Hallie. Okay. But that could change. And I think that that's what, what is getting people concerned is that, you know, we're not, we're not thinking that this monkeypox is going to really change and evolve. It is what's called a DNA virus. They don't mutate the way COVID-19 mutated to become more transmissible. But yeah, absolutely, you could, you could get it, you know, with, with household contacts and, and in the classroom. And, you know, what about a sports team? I mean, we need to be prepared for this, Hallie, for us to just sit here and say, you know, it's only intimate sexual contact and it's only in, you know, men who have sex with men is so short-sighted. And I think that's why we're hearing and seeing a lot of frustration amongst public health and as well as infectious disease experts um, at where we are right now. Dr. Natalie Azar, thank you. Appreciate yeah. it. In the next hour or so, we're going to hear from Pope Francis, a Canada's only Catholic parish specifically for Indigenous peoples. Another stop on his week-long so-called trip of penance for the generations of physical and sexual abuse done to children at the country's church-run residential schools. You, you probably have heard at least something about this, okay? This is where more than 150,000 indigenous kids got ripped from their families to go to these boarding schools during the 20th century. Thousands of them died with a lot of unmarked graves only just getting discovered last year. All of them went through what the government is calling cultural genocide. So the Pope's speech is going to come just hours after he visited the ruins of one of these former schools in Maswachis, where he saw some of the graves firsthand. 
This is his first trip to Canada since the church's first formal apology back in April. And he's telling a crowd of survivors and their families that he is deeply sorry on behalf of all Christians. I myself wish to reaffirm this with shame and unambiguously. I humbly beg forgiveness for the evil committed by so many Christians against the indigenous peoples. NBC's Claudio Lavagna is traveling with the Pope in Edmonton, Alberta. And Claudio, you know, what is so striking here is this is a trip explicitly for penance. It's not a byproduct of some other stop. It's not an add-on, etc. This mission is for forgiveness. You've covered the church in Rome. You're based in Italy for a long time. Help us understand the significance of the Pope here today. Hey, Holly. Well, I've followed the Pope around the world and I've seen many, many of similar meetings around the world as well. It's not the first time he meets indigenous people, but this is the first time, as you mentioned, that the whole trip is concentrated around that. Usually, you know, it's kind of half and half. He meets the uh, religious, he meets the Catholic, he meets the government, and then he meets also the indigenous or he meets the uh, survivors of sexual uh, abuse. This is not one of those cases. I've never uh, been in a trip like this where, as you called it, he called it himself a pilgrimage of penance uh, where and he, and he can actually you can feel it that it is a pilgrimage of penance since this morning where he's made his first appearance uh, there uh, on the grounds of that former residential school but from the time that he stopped there uh, in silent prayer in that cemetery on unmarked graves to the times where he really felt it when he said sorry so many times when he said um, that he begged for forgiveness for so many times and it's not the first time he says that to with the indigenous people, uh, the indigenous communities of Canada. He said sorry at the Vatican, but it's a whole different dimension uh, and it assumes a whole different uh, meaning when he travels all the way here, especially in his conditions. He has, he has mobility problems. You can see that. He needs to be wheeled around on a wheelchair because of his knee problems. Uh, so it is very, very significant that it is here and that he's doing what he's doing. It's just the first time uh, this morning that he met with the uh, leaders of the community community of the indigenous communities and the survivors, he will do that over and over again in several parts of Canada, Holly. The Pope is thinking about more than forgiveness, Claudio. He's saying that he's saying begging pardon, in, in his words, is not the end of the matter. That's a quote. We've been hearing from people from the First Nations. You've talked a little bit about the response from the indigenous peoples. What are we, what are we hearing from them and what do we expect the church to actually do as it relates to reparations here? Well, that's perhaps the most significant part of his speech this morning. Uh, yes, we were expecting we were expecting him to say sorry and beg for forgiveness. But he said, as you mentioned, that asking for forgiveness and saying sorry is only the first right. step. So what steps are next? He said uh, that he will develop or foster a culture in the Catholic Church uh, that will look after and respect uh, indigenous populations, not only in Canada, but also around the world. But at the same time, he also announced some sort of uh, serious investigation, he called it, uh, into what happened in these residential schools from the end of the 19th century all the way to the end of the 1970s uh, in order to also uh, help uh, those who were affected by that trauma, Ali. Claudio Lavagna, live for us there in Edmonton. Good to see you. Thank you. We'll look for more reporting from the Pope's speech later tonight. Appreciate it. Coming up, a conspiracy theorist on trial today in Texas, beginning now that'll determine how much Alex Jones has to pay Sandy Hook Elementary School parents for lying that the mass shooting there was a hoax. We'll talk about what we've learned in court. Plus, what scientists are saying about a link between napping a lot and high blood pressure. We'll be right back. So jury selection is starting today in the defamation trial against Alex Jones, InfoWars host and noted conspiracy theorist. And once this jury is picked, they're going to decide just how much he has to pay Sandy Hook families after he lied and said the shooting there was a hoax. He's being sued by some of the families of these victims you see on screen. These 20 children, these 20 little kids and the six adults killed in the 2012 Sandy Hook shooting for saying that the massacre involved actors Jones said, who just tried to basically boost support for gun control in this country. Jones has since acknowledged the shooting did happen. But for some of the families, his lies have affected them in serious and deep ways. 
the trauma that he imposes, the pain and suffering with uh, with the lies he peddles. You know, to say that Sandy Hook was a hoax and it never happened, it's an outright lie. So today, jury selection, some of the potential jurors, some of the people being interviewed, talked about this. One person said monetary compensation does not replace life. Others talked about how they believe in free speech. But some said people who have big following should be held accountable. Courts have already found Jones liable for defamation. NBC News has reached out to Jones' team for comment on the suit and today's trial starting, but no response as of now. Let me start with Rahema Ellis. This, you know, we've covered this here on the show, Rahema. This trial delayed and then delayed again. It was supposed to start back in April. Talk to me about what stood out from today and this jury selection situation. It seems that the uh, lawyers in this case are trying to decide, particularly the lawyers for the parents of the children who were murdered, are trying to decide whether or not they can get 12 jurors who will be unbiased. If not decide whether or not Jones is liable or not, that's already been determined. But whether or not they can follow the facts, the law, and the instructions from the jury. So take a look at what we got from some tweets of our affiliate reporter down in Austin who is in the courtroom. Let me put up a full screen panel if you can for you, where one juror asks, what if you think the defendant should pay every cent of the money that they have? And this is what a juror is asking. And so whether or not that person is allowed on the jury is questionable. Another full screen, when our reporter inside the courtroom says many jurors are asking for more context on how the amounts would be calculated. One juror says, if you're asking someone to pay $200 million, you better have a good reason. So they've got a pool of 100 potential jurors, and they're trying to whittle that down to 12, 12 people who can be unbiased, and instead just, again, follow the letter of the law, the facts, and the instructions from the jury. They're finding that a lot of people that they spoke to today said they couldn't be unbiased, that they were biased about whether they should award someone, this family, a lot of money. So. But they've got a lot of people to pull to pull from to get 12, yeah. Allie. They're confident That's they can do That's for sure. It. That's going to take a minute. Um, you know, Rahima, I know we can't get into sort of specific money figures because we just don't know what they are right now. That's not something that we can get into. But we do sure. know that even though Jones is off of YouTube, off of Facebook, off of Spotify because he violated their policies on hate speech, he used to be pretty popular back in 2015, 2018. That's when the InfoWars store made more than $165 million that period. I wonder about the impact of this trial on this business that Jones built, um, in part based on some of the conspiracy theories that he pushed. Well, he's wondering about that, too, and that's why before this trial began, he put his assets into what's called uh, InfoWars, into bankruptcy protection. And now he's claiming that he has a negative worth of minus $20 million, suggesting he's already in the hole even before a juror has awarded him $1 to say we don't even know how much they might award the family in this case. So. Could it lead to the end of the popularity of InfoWars in terms of its money-making capability? That's yet to be determined, Hallie. And, Rahima, I, I keep coming back to something that we heard a little bit in that introduction here from a couple of years ago, but the families of people who are affected by this, right? Because they have talked about, like, they're, they're centered here, and let's center them, because they're the ones who've gotten death threats. They're the ones who have gotten harassment from people who follow Alex Jones because of his lies. I, I, I'm thinking a lot tonight about what this defamation trial means for them. Well... You make an excellent point, and that's the point that the families make, and that is that this is not a victimless allegation for them to say, for Alex Jones to have alleged that what the massacre that happened at Sandy Hook was all a hoax. They say that they felt, the families say that they feel pain and real threats from harassments and from death threats that they've gotten from Alex Jones's followers who believed this hoax that he was peddling on InfoWars. So for them, if they have any vindication at all, it is first and foremost, there has been a trial where the judge said that Alex Jones is liable. He was not telling the truth. Now, the question becomes one of what kind of monetary uh, burden that Alex Jones may be asked to bear as a result of this. 
the families, I suspect, hope that it could be enough, that this will put a calm to some people who might think that there is some reward for them, some fame, if they would continue a uh, hoax similar to what Alex Jones did. They hope this will stop that. Al okay. Rahima Ellis, uh, stand on top of this one. Rahima, good to see you. Thank you. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, officials in Canada say a man who was targeting homeless people shot and killed two men in a suburb of Vancouver today before being killed by police. At least two other people were hurt, but no word on the suspect's identity or motive. Number two, a new study published in an American Heart Association journal shows a link between napping and high blood pressure or stroke. That sounds kind of counterintuitive, right? But researchers found that people, adults who nap a lot, have a higher risk for those kinds of health problems than people who never nap. Now that's not because of like the sleeping part of it, but because people who nap are probably doing so because they're tired and not getting enough good quality sleep in the first place. Number three, the sixth teenager charged in the so-called Central Park Five case was exonerated today. In 1989, Stephen Lopez, along with five other Latino and black teens, was arrested in a woman's rape and assault. Lopez reached a deal with prosecutors to plead guilty to a lesser charge and served three years in prison. But today, a district attorney said he pleaded guilty under immense external pressure, in their words. The other teens' convictions were overturned in 2002 after evidence linked a convicted serial rapist and murderer to the woman's attack. Number four, a chess-playing robot broke a young boy's finger during a tournament in Moscow last week. No! You can see the seven-year-old trying to make a move before the AI-powered robot finishes the robot's move. So the robot gets the kid's finger instead of a chess piece and fractured it. The head of the Moscow Chess Federation told Russian state media that, and I'm quoting here, this, of course, is bad. Th that is true. Reportedly, the boy finished the tournament, but wore a cast. Number five, Adele's Las Vegas residency finally rescheduled. You might remember she postponed her shows earlier this year, just 24 hours before opening night. She apologized at the time, said her show ain't ready, she said, because of COVID, her crew wasn't there. New shows start in November. New concerns now about sharks after a bunch of sightings and attacks around the country. Take a look at these new pictures off Cape Cod. After almost two dozen sightings there, some of the sharks, you see this video on the monitor there, some of them 30 yards from shore. Over in Alabama, there's a shark fin. Can you spot the shark fin swimming right by the beach? There it is. It's not just the sightings. People are getting bitten, too. In New York, at least six people ended up with shark bites in just the last few weeks. The governor there has even called in drones to try to keep an eye on things. But some experts are saying this might not be so bad, that it might be a sign that nature is healing, they say. Proof that shark conservation efforts are actually working and that the oceans are getting their balance back after so much overfishing and pollution. Here's Kathy Park. The beach has certainly been a great place to cool off during the hot summer months, but a lot of folks have been on edge recently because of a rise in shark sightings on both coasts. Here at Rockaway Beach this weekend, the beach was closed off for swimming for several hours because of another shark sighting. And throughout the state of New York, especially in coastal communities, a lot of officials have heightened up their shark surveillance uh, on the ground and also in the air in New York's Long Island. And in just the past three weeks, there have been at least six reported shark attacks. And while experts say that shark attacks are extremely rare, they say that a lot of these large predators are coming closer to the shoreline because their environment is getting much better and conservation efforts are working. But if you do want to avoid any sort of scary shark encounter, consider this. Uh, avoid swimming at dusk or dawn, especially during the nighttime hours, because that's when sharks are most active. And also remember to take off the jewelry when you jump into the water because the shine and the reflection off that jewelry could mimic fish scales. And lastly, when you do go in the water, try not to splash around too much and kick up the water because that could also signal that you are potentially a wounded prey. Back to you. Kathy Park with that. When we come back here on the show, Indiana lawmakers, now the first in the country to call a special session since the overturning of Roe versus Wade. They're looking at a bill that would ban most abortions there. We'll talk about the protesters, the vice president, and who else showed up in Indiana today after the break.
to Indiana now, a state that is ground zero, but coming ground zero for the fight over abortion access in this country. Because not long ago, we saw day one of a special session wrapping up with lawmakers looking at a bill to ban nearly all abortions in the state with only limited exceptions. Why is this a big deal? It's the first special session like this since the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade, that landmark ruling that had protected abortion rights in this country up until just recently. And that's why you saw scenes like the ones that you're looking at. However you're looking at it, dozens of people showing up at the Capitol in Indianapolis to protest this bill. Vice President Kamala Harris, she was there, too, talking with state legislators on this fight to protect reproductive rights. And as that was happening, this split screen moment with this, a case that is in the national spotlight being heard in court. You're looking at the accused rapist of a 10 year old girl who police say had to travel to Indiana from Ohio to get an abortion. I want to bring in our Shaq Brewster to talk about this. So, Shaq, let me start with what happened at the State House here, because as we said, this was the beginning, right, of a state that we're seeing the first time that a state went into special session to look at a banning abortion. Talk about what we've seen today, the timeline, because I think Republicans, and I talked with the top Democrat in the House today in that Indiana State House, Republicans have a supermajority. There's only so much Democrats can do. That's exactly right, Holly. And the House will likely take this bill up next week. But today it was the state Senate taking up this piece of legislation that would effectively ban abortion in the state of Indiana. Now, it's a near total ban. It's not a total ban because of some exceptions that are included in the proposed legislation, exceptions for rape, incest, for the life of the mother or some fetal abnormalities. But this would definitely be a rollback of the abortion protections that women in Indiana have had for some time. And that's why you have those scenes that you're looking at on the other side of the screen there. The protesters that came out, I'll tell you, those protesters seemingly numbered in the hundreds uh, when you combine the protests that you saw both inside and outside. And then you also had that visit from Vice President Harris, who met with lawmakers, had a roundtable with a few dozen lawmakers, and acknowledged the fact that, yeah, at the federal level, they're limited in what they can do to protect women in the state of Indiana. But she wanted to lend her support for women in that state and for the lawmakers who are fighting against that legislation. Listen a little bit to, uh, uh, to, of her message to how she set up the stakes there. The parameters that are being proposed mean that for the vast majority of women, by the time she realizes she is pregnant, she will effectively be prohibited from having access to reproductive health care that would allow her to choose what happens to her body. Now, based on the latest schedule that we saw, it seems as if the Senate will likely vote on this at some point by the end of the week. They're also considering legislation to support families, in the words of the Republican lawmakers, providing about $45 million for things like maternal assistance and for increasing the adoption tax credit. But it's that restriction on abortion that is, without a doubt, Hallie, the most controversial part and for the piece sure. that's getting the most attention. Let's talk about this other piece of this, right, Jack? Because as this was going down, there was another nexus to Indiana as it related to the arraignment of the suspect accused of raping yeah. this 10-year-old girl who police say got an abortion, traveled to Indiana, became pregnant, and traveled to Indiana to get an abortion. This has become, this particular case, a kind of flashpoint here nationally. We've heard President Biden talk about it. We've heard a lot of high-profile politicians cite this case. Talk about the court proceedings today. That's right. She traveled to Indiana because of the restrictions that existed in Ohio. But today we saw that 27-year-old man, the suspect in this case, accused of raping a 10-year-old, Gerson uh, Fuentes. We saw him in court uh, appear before a judge. He appeared via video. We didn't hear from him at all. Uh, and we saw him in handcuffs. There was a translator also present. But through his attorney, he entered two not guilty pleas for that felony rape of a child under 13 years old. That's a charge, Hallie, or those are charges that carry a maximum life sentence and a minimum sentence of about 10 years for each individual charge. So these are very serious charges, but they're also getting wrapped into the debate that you're seeing, not just in Ohio, where this case is occurred, but, where in, but also in Indiana, where you have lawmakers working to restrict the access that women there have to abortion. Shaquille Brewster, thank you so much, Shaq. Good to see you. Coming up, flights grounded at an airport in Texas today after a woman straight up opened fire by a ticket counter, just started shooting. We're going to give you a look at some of those scary moments. Plus, 
a bishop and his wife robbed right in the middle of a live streamed sermon. How much the thieves got. Look at this. And more ugh, coming up in just a second. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. From our Northeast Bureau, New York City Police, you have to look at this video because this is legit bonkers. They say a, a bishop in Brooklyn was robbed at gunpoint, look at this, right in the middle of a church service that was being live streamed. You, you, are, you are watching this. These three gunmen, I guess, allegedly stole something like $400,000 worth of jewelry from Bishop Lamar Whitehead and his wife, including they took his wedding band. Nobody got hurt, but the bishop said his congregation was traumatized. Police are still investigating this whole thing. Also from our Northeast Bureau, what looks like a humpback whale, check this out, breaching the water, jump, you know, kind of getting out of the water and landing right on top of a boat off the coast of Plymouth. There it is. See that? Basically dunked the front of this 19-foot boat. But the, uh, you know, the front of the boat pops up again. Officials say nobody got hurt, but the boat obviously got a little bit of damage. Not too much, though. From our West Coast Bureau, a woman got hurt after getting too close to an endangered monk seal and her pup. Our affiliate in Hawaii reports she was in an area that was roped off. Officials said don't go swimming there, but the animal charged at her. You can see she was sort of struggling to get away. Witnesses say it looked like she hurt her arm. People nearby eventually helped pull her from the water. Did you hear about what happened in Dallas today? Gunshots fired. Shots fired at a big U.S. airport when police say a woman let off a gun inside Dallas Love Field. They say she came out of a bathroom in the terminal and started firing shots at the ceiling right near a ticket counter. Look at some of these people. People start hiding. People start running. Right, a police officer ended up shooting this person with a gun. She was taken to a local hospital, but the terminal was evacuated. The FAA issued a total ground stop. Transportation Secretary Buttigieg, Pete Buttigieg, says his department and the FAA have reached out to locals about this. I want to bring in now Priscilla Thompson. And Priscilla, talk, you are there. Talk about where the investigation stands now. This is so strange. Did police have a motive for the shooting? Do we know what else happened or what we're hearing from folks there? Well, Hallie, no motive yet from police, but they have identified the shooter as 37-year-old Portia Odafuwa. Uh, based on a public records request that our NBC uh, team did, it appears that she does have a number of prior arrests. But as it relates to motive, what we are hearing is what witnesses are saying she said just before she began shooting. And witnesses say that when she emerged from that bathroom near the ticket counter, one woman told us she just heard a woman near her rambling and she got nervous and uncomfortable and moved away. Other witnesses saying that she came out and said, I have an announcement to make, and that she began talking about her marriage, uh, saying that her husband had cheated on her before she started shooting. And so that is what we're hearing from witnesses. But of course, police have not yet said what the motive may be. But what we do know is that police were in the airport very quickly once that shooting started. An officer was able to shoot uh, the woman who was shooting in her lower extremities, and she was the only person injured in this incident. There were no other people who were in the airport that were injured. They took her into custody, took her to the hospital, and right now the FBI and Dallas police are still investigating, um, hoping to get an update from them tomorrow with more information about why this may have happened um, and really any other insight they can share about this really a bizarre incident that certainly scared a lot of people here at the airport today. Priscilla, you know, the, a bunch of people had to evacuate. You had um, the regional TSA tweeting, because of this, uh, everybody had to go out, come back in, be rescreened, no exceptions. Has there been a domino effect on flights um, and on people trying to get where they're going at this point? Absolutely, Hallie. We're talking about 900 plus flights that were delayed, 200 plus that were canceled. I can tell you, I came, I flew in uh, from Houston to a nearby Dallas airport, and there was a lot of commotion at the terminals that were supposed to be uh, heading here and the gates that were supposed to be heading here with people trying to figure out what they were going to do. And for the folks who were inside when that shooting happened, uh, it was chaos. They all had to be evacuated. They were sequestered outside in this, what is now 
triple digit heat as TSA worked to get them all back through security screening and get them back onto those flights to get where they're going. I will say as I was coming in, I did see some Southwest flights taking off. So it appears that things are beginning to get back on track. But still, a lot of people are, are scared and shaken up by what they saw and experienced today. We spoke to one woman and I want to play a little bit of what she shared. I have a three and a five year old little boy and it just frightens me. I I was so relieved they weren't with me and yet now I'm afraid to even go to Disneyland in a few days when we drive down Highway 1. So the good news is folks do seem to be getting out, but still a lot of fear, a lot of concern over this just crazy incident that happened here today, Hallie. Priscilla Thompson live for us there in Dallas. Priscilla, good to see you. Thank you. To tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been keeping an eye on. And let me set the scene for you here. You're on your phone, right? You're swiping around on a dating app and, oh, hey, you connect with somebody. You are vibing. This conversation is going well. You are into this person. So you don't even think twice when they ask you for some cash. Maybe you fork over a couple bucks and a couple bucks more and then pretty soon. Guess what? You've been scammed. There's a name for it, a romance scam, where these people use fake identities to try to win over your trust. They try to get the affection of potential partners. Usually people agree to transfer money as a favor to this, like, you know, fresh, lusty love of their life who's in a sudden financial bind, according to this new Federal Trade Commission report. Romance scams surged in the pandemic. They hit a record high in 2021, with people losing something like $550 million, up nearly 80 percent from the year before. NBC's Jake Ward is taking a look at these new numbers. He has more. Wendy, a 75-year-old widow from Los Angeles, says she was recently approached online by an attractive older man. He claimed to be an executive chef, and he had just signed a contract for a, a cruise line that was going to take him out of town. I believe it was for about six weeks. But soon, she says, he had tricked her into buying him gift cards he could turn into cash. I wanted to believe and I wanted to help this new person that had just made me feel so good. Jane Lee, a cybersecurity investigator, knows this story well. They initially shower their victims with compliments. They quickly move the conversation over to an encrypted messaging platform. He wanted to transfer our dialogue onto Google Chat. Experts say it is always headed the same place. I, I think all scams in general lead to money. He claimed that he had an account with a company similar to Dropbox and that he had forgotten to pay his annual premium. Wendy spent about $1,000 before she figured things out, and that's pretty good compared to other victims. The FBI estimates that in 2021, more than 24,000 people, women and men, lost an average of more than $40,000 to online romance scams, a billion dollars overall. And Jane Lee's investigations show that users of every major dating platform are at risk. She walked us through one scam on Hinge, a popular app. The scammers have a terrible term for what Wendy went through. They call it pig butchering. They quite literally are referring to their victims as pigs that they plumping up. So they're fattening them up wow. uh, with the compliments and, you know, uh, with all the money and promises. And then eventually they do go in for the kill. That it's, is dark. Yeah, scum of the earth type of stuff. But forget the stereotype of an older person taken in. Half of victims, Lee says, are 41 or younger. Lee says these scammers pretend to be attractive entrepreneurs on dating apps. They always insert something about successful business. They manipulate female victims into buying cryptocurrency on a fake investment page. They're scraping legitimate data such that you, it looks like a trading place. Yeah, it's it's very organized. It's our digital lives and our real feelings used against us. In your view, could the dating apps be doing something more to protect people? I think so. Uh, yeah. I, I do. You should be able to see these types of anomalous or ab abnormal types of interactions that are occurring on your platform. In a statement to NBC News, Hinge says in part they take fraud very seriously, adding that they continue to explore and invest in new updates and technologies to ensure we're keeping our daters as safe and protected as possible. As for Wendy, she says she's just glad to be on the other side of it. I'm lucky that I didn't get taken for even more money. I still do need to have my guard up, and so does everybody else. Jake Ward, NBC News, San Francisco.
RJ Ford, thank you. So to come here on the show, a viral TikTok makeup trend. But this one has some folks a little bit worried. We'll tell you the latest thing that people are smearing on their faces. Oh boy, stand by. So what are people smearing on their faces to try to look super hot on TikTok? Um, calamine lotion, the thing that you put on your poison ivy to make your itches go away. Now it's like a big hot makeup trend, but some doctors are like, people, what are you doing? This is not great. Look at this, right? You've got all these influencers slathering it on as like a primer, right? So it's a primer that goes underneath your makeup. The hashtag calamine primer has three and a half million views and counting. That is a bananas number of views for a beauty hack, quote unquote, that doctors say is like not so great of an idea. And it's so popular that if you go to the store, like some people are reporting they need calamine ocean because of chicken pox or poison ivy or whatever. They cannot find it because people are buying it up to use as makeup. I want to bring in our internet and culture reporter, Callan Rosenblatt. It doesn't even make sense, Callan. And let's be like, let's be honest. We, we haven't. You're not going to like get liver disease if you use this, right? There's not like some awful, harmful, dangerous thing. We're not trying to like overstate it, but it's like kind of bizarre. It's, it might give you wrinkles. Doctors say it could actually dry out your skin even more. Antithetical to the point of what these people doing it for makeup wanted to do. Absolutely. And Hallie, I mean, it's a short term, like great beauty hack because it masks out your skin, makes the makeup go on really smooth. But if you suffer from, you know, large pores, dark circles, scars, doctors say it can actually make all of those things like way worse. So it's going to be, as you said, antithetical to the point of why you're using the makeup. If you're going to make all those issues worse, just stick with it with a dollar store primer. It's, it's much better than putting calamine on your face. And it's not like this is the first time we've seen a TikTok trend take off. I think about, you know, some of them are harmless. Lettuce water at night to help you sleep. Like drink <laughs> lettuce water. Some of them are weird with like the cinnamon stuff. This, this happens a lot here. Totally. And Hallie, you know as well as I do, we live in, in an attention economy where when you see something going viral, you see something that sounds like a good hack, you're going to start engaging with it. When you engage with it, you see it more. When you see it more, it starts popping up in other people's For You pages. And it'll jump to other sites like Twitter, where this hack is also spreading. I mean, we, we live in a place where not only do users know that a good hack will get attention, the algorithm knows. And the algorithm is what's going to keep pushing it forward. And, you know, TikTok, for, for the most part, when, a, when a, a challenge is very dangerous, something like the milk crate challenge, they're pretty good at removing it immediately and not letting other people share it. But these these hacks that are, you know, a little less dangerous that may just uh, involve scarring or darkening of dark spots, that's they're a little less stringent about that. So you're going to see these things blow up again in this attention economy where the algorithm is going to show you what is engaged with most. Callan Rosenblatt, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Before we let you go, we want to let you know about tomorrow because we will have an interview you will see only right here on this show on NBC News Now. And that is my conversation that I just wrapped up with American Trevor Reed who was released from Russia in a prisoner swap earlier this year. We talked about the other Americans detained there, what the White House is doing to get them out, and how his life is slowly starting to return to a new kind of normal. That's tomorrow right here on NBC News Now, 5 o'clock Eastern, wherever you get your stream. That does it for us. I'll see you here then. Same time, same place. Coverage picks up right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.